We are all the way up here in the big smoke, or I guess now they call it the six, whatever. Yeah, the six. The six in Toronto, Ontario, uh, with my very good friend, Mr. Christian Aldo. How's it going, brother? Um, I'd say it's a, today it's a 7.5 out of 10. Beautiful. That's a good day. Yeah. That's a good day. I think, I, I think most people are a 7, point, 7 out of 10. Mm -hmm. That means it's just, you're just neutral, like you're okay. Right. But I Wouldn't think that be that, a five, but, but if you can, if five you can uh, for a while there, I swear to God, like for about a whole year, I was an eight out of ten every day when I woke up. Yeah, a fucking eight. Starting when? Because you were not when, like when that. I scored when I hold scored on, the new no, when I scored the new gallery space. Yeah, so because we the, let's bring it all the way back. We there's all kinds of ways where this interview is going to go. I know you can but, point to any time in my life, and I'll tell you what I was out of ten. So we were the last time you and I spent any sort of time together was right before you moved out of Windsor was how long ago now? Um, November, I was officially gonzo November 1st, 2009. Yep, yeah, so yeah, right around, yeah. So, um, oh my God. So let's, uh, so let's catch up a little bit, I guess. There's, normally on these interviews, what we do is we go back to the very beginning history uh, with our guests, but um, I think most, yeah, you know what, let's do that a little bit and we'll get, we'll get yeah, to where yeah, okay. So tell me about, cause you have a really interesting family history. Huh. So like, I, what I know about your family is your family was responsible for the high ho restaurants, right? Yep. Um, talk to me about that. Cause talk to me about your growing up in, in the house you grew up in. Oh, my, my, my grandfather was a really ambitious, uh, restaurant tour. He had a restaurant chain. Uh, it was, it was super, uh, innovative. Uh, he was a bit of a revolutionary in the restaurant business, but I guess sometimes he became so insular with his, with his own ideas and his revolutionary ideas that he wasn't able to branch out. Like for example, Colonel Sanders begged him to become a partner. He said, nah, don't need your partnership. And he only ever did is hit six, six, six restaurants. Is that a for fucking real story? That's a real fucking story. How did he even do McDonald's, he, did, he was the first one to do drive-through. He did it way before drive-through. Uh -huh. People thought, why would somebody want to drive-through? It just, these were concepts that, you know, like, like the idea, but Uber Eats now. Right. Nobody would give a shit about that. But back then, but, Sometimes, like something that's that's just so obvious, it's it's too new for it. It's we're not ready for it. Um, uh, people from Burger King and McDonald's and Wendy's would would go to the restaurant and steal his menus to see how he did the menus with the nice colors and uh, like there was a lot of like a uh, like sort of like uh, industrial espionage going on with the restaurant. That's like, like that's a he cool was like a story. super crazy pioneer. Okay, and. Um, but that that's the problem sometimes. Like, I remember my dad talking about the Hi-Ho restaurants. Yeah, they all, everyone like, talks about it. You know what I mean? Because, like, I didn't really get to experience it. I remember the the rest, the, the last I remember, the, like, there's a bunch of them that are back now. Is that your family? No. Yeah. Okay. So the last... It, it's no longer relevant. Okay. But, but, but the whole point is, I was going to say, is, is sometimes there'll be, um, there'll be a maverick who will... who will create something that's revolutionary, but he will insulate himself. So at a certain point of its, of its trajectory, it stops growing or it stops branching out and it becomes insular. And therefore that's how you get left behind. It's kind of like the Japanese, uh, like 200, 250 years ago, they, they became isolationists. Right. And what happened? 200 years go by and American gunships come and say, you're gonna open your ports to us. Mm -hmm. And the samurai get their asses kicked. Right. That's what happens. And that can happen in business, that can happen in art, that can happen in fucking music. Right. You know, when one day Billy Idol wakes up and realizes he's still in the 80s. It yeah. just shit happens. That's, right? It, okay, so talk to me about the... So that was your grandfather, though, right? Yeah. Okay, so talk to me about mom and dad and, and, and your brother. Oh, my dad, he's, um, you know, he's like a... Almost like an Olympic-level cycling coach. He's like a cycling guru. He does training camps all over uh, the States and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He's uh, in the 70s. He's retiring. I mean, he's retired, but he does what he loves to do. Uh, but he's slowing down. Was he a cycling? Like, that's what he did yeah, professionally? He's, he's, he was he's... obsessed with uh, cycling as, as much as I'm obsessed with toy soldiers. Really? Yeah. Was that his career, though? Oh, well, yeah. Well, it became after he retired from GM. Oh, okay. It, listen, this shit isn't interesting. You want to tell no, me no, no, no. It's very shit? interesting. No, no, no. You let's know what? talk about... Let's let shit roll. Uh, let's that's... pull our fucking cocks out and just let it fucking roll. It was rolling. This and is you contrived shit. It. This is contrived shit. No, 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 no. Nobody wants to hear this fucking No, no, no. Crap. You know why they want to hear it? Because what? it's important for me to sort of understand the base that the person I'm talking to comes from. And I, I learn quite a bit 
from people when they tell me about the house that they grew up in. So, so dad worked at Chrysler's, but was super. No, a GM. GM he, was a, he was a he was a he was a millwright at GM. My right. mom was a was a good, hardworking uh, house mom. Right. So yes, no matter how eccentric you may be, a f- a good, strong family structure with a good dad. Right. Who will tell you, son? Pull up your pants. Don't wear your pants below your ass cheeks. Pull up your pants. Put a belt on and be a man. You need you need your dad to tell you that. You know what's funny? You it, it's funny that you bring it up that way because you and and we've had this. I've said this to you a couple of times over the last few hours. You were the first like true sort of art artist artist person that I know. And despite that, you have one of the the most sort of like anti artist background histories that I can imagine because normally when people the only about- reason why I ever became an artist was to impress the beautiful girls in my art class in high school no shit I make God that's how it started but uh, most most anything that I do it's it's always it starts off with a with a goofy reason why did we start making movies it was because um, some stripper girl dumped me who says I want to be a movie star so I said yeah well I'm going to be making a movie and so then we made Zeno's Inferno. <laughs> that's the, that's and everybody the, got took their clothes off for that one. <laughs> everybody in Toronto. Yeah, except for George, of course. Were you George is fluffing? In fact, were were you because were you a super high energy kid? Had yes, to have been. I was right? super high energy, but you know what? The energy never went away. I no, still, well, clearly, I still have the same kind of energy as like uh, Quentin Tarantino or Martin Scorsese when you hear them talk. I just I can fire. How did? Did you, because like I know even, even now, like, uh, like being a high energy person, people react to that. Yeah, they do. It's nice, like they, you know, I could, did you ever notice around certain people, they'll take your energy away? Yeah. Ugh. I hope that I don't have that adverse effect on people sometimes. I'm, I, I might, because there's certain friends whenever I'm around, like they just tire me out. But like, um, uh, but. I'm that guy that can rally the troops and get anything done. Yeah. Like if I say, okay, guys, we're going to make a big, crazy music video with no money and make it look like a million dollars, amazing people will come aboard and we'll make a million dollar music video. I'm that guy that uh, can open up a uh, $10,000 a month gallery venue with, with no money and just uh, convince the right people that it's the right thing to do. I'm that guy that can, um, that can create a haunted house with, with practically no money and just using found objects and just... Right. I can do that. I, I, talk to me about, because when I met you, you were already living at the, the old YMCA yep. building, right? I'm pretty yep. sure. Talk to me about how you got into that space. That ah, you okay. I was, um, you know, everybody, I imagine, you know the way the stock market crashed in 1929? Yeah. And then the stock market crashed again, I think, like, I forget, Black Monday, whatever the fuck. Mm. I had a personal crash. I remember it was around 2003, and I was doing, uh, I was doing, taking on too many projects, and I was secretly starting to realize that in Windsor, I was bouncing my head off the ceiling. Okay. I, I pretty much went as far as I could go in Windsor. This is pre-computer times too, and I just, I sort of crashed and I sort of gave up, and I, and I moved down to my dad's basement, and I was just, I, I was really, really low, and I, I, I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And uh, Larry Horowitz bought the, um, he bought the, uh, the old YMCA. YMCA. And so I made it into an art studio. And then we both agreed that I should live there to keep my eye on the building. Because the truth was, if I was not living there, it would have been, oh, been constantly raided and, and broken into. Yeah. Constantly. So me and my dog, like, we were constantly omnipresent. Yep. And, like, and, you know, I go to bed at 5 a.m. every, I go to bed at 5 a.m. every night and wake up every day at 11 a.m. Yeah. I only need about three or four hours sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte, I found out, only needed three hours a night sleep a Same night. Thing, yeah, yeah. I do not need, I only need one meal a day. I, I, um, have you always been like that? I'm, I'm 49 years old. I have no gray hair. Yeah. That's I, I, which great. is fucking weird. I, I'm muscular, like a, like a fucking brick shit house. I sleep only about four hours a night. I jerk off once a day. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just, um, I don't know. I have no answers for any of this shit. When I get injured, I repair fucking quick. Yeah. I hardly ever get sick. I have no answers for this. And and you know what? I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. It just 
It's a weird genetic fluke. I don't know what it is. It, I have no answers to this. It's interesting to me because, like I said, you you were the first sort of like living artist that I ever met in my life. And, and one of the things that was super interesting to me and, and super uh, attractive, for lack of a better word to me, was the idea that you did just sort of like, you did whatever the fuck you <laughs> felt like doing, but not in a way that was like destructive. It was just kind of like, oh, wait, I've got this fucking idea. You know what I just mean? Just do it. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I'm like, I'm like, I, like now at the gallery, I'm doing 10 minute theater yeah. where I'm, um, I'm writing plays that are less than 10 minutes and we perform them and we're filling the house, we're packing the house, we're selling it out. Did you ever have like a time when it was hard for you to, to like follow an idea? No, or str- no. It was always like this. It's a trajectory thing. Okay. I remember what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. Because of the nature of what it is that I do for a living, think of it as a um, think of it as a, um, a a howitzer cannon. I take an I I create an idea which is a missile and I load it into the cannon. I set my sights. I fire the trajectory. The idea g- goes through a trajectory, and then it comes down. And it lands as close to the goal as possible with an explosion, and it usually hits. Okay. But most people, what well, they say, I'm a fucking promoter. Well, they'll they'll load the cannon, they'll fire it, and then they don't care where what happens with the missile. The missile just disappears, or they they load the cannon and never fire it, or they just fire it and it just doesn't even it, wherever it hits, they don't know. But my training, because I would have to come up with an idea for a painting, I'd have to make the painting, then I'd have to finish the painting, and then I would have to sell the painting and deliver the painting, and then I would hang it on the client's wall. If I don't start something from conception to delivery, it's failure. So that whole trajectory concept, I apply it to everything I do. Where did you get that from? I don't know. Is that a thing that was just always part of it? I realized as the years went on, yeah. it's, a, it's a subconscious form of training. Okay. So for example, um, if I say um, I'm making a new song now and I'm making a music video for it, um, I've gone out on my own now and now I'm making my own music. I'm, so now I'm in the recording studio and I'm creating a song. And I'm not, and it'll be, it'll work on it till it's done. It's a big epic song. And then now I'm putting all the things, put together a music video. We're going to create the music video and then we're going to film the music video. And then when the music video is done, then I'm going to promote it and, 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 and proliferate it. And then some product will come from it. Mm-hmm. There is no such thing as me starting a project and it halfway done. That rarely ever happens. Okay. If it does happen, it, I mean, I'm not always perfect, but my training is from the sperm leaving the tip of the dick to a baby coming out of the fucking womb. Right. There's no abortions. It, it goes full arc. Right. Everything. Has that, like, were you like that as a kid? Like, when no. You do, no? That was, that was an accidental thing that was developed over the years of being a, a, a full-time artist. Right. When did you... I, because you started to make a painting and you finished a painting and you fucking sold it and you delivered it. When did you start to consider yourself to be an artist? Once I started to use the label as a young kid in his early 20s or in his teens, because the, because the label gave me a, a sense of, uh, of, of security or identity. I'm an artist! You did. I don't even like even calling myself an no, artist no, no, anymore. But you, but you I did, just, I'm me. But you did at one point, you used it like that, right? Well, yeah, it was just because you need, I'm a new waiver! <laughs> like, gives a fuck. Right. But, but that's what people need. When you're a teenager, you need to identify yourself with, um, uh, with, with a tribe of some sort. I'm a rock and roller. I'm a fucking rapper. Nowadays, I'm just me, and I jokingly call myself an imperson. Imper- what's that word again? Uh, um, impersonario. Okay. Impersonario. Imperson. Whatever. Fuck. Impresario. Impresario. Oh, but I'm, I'm not anything. I mean, even that's a pretentious fucking word. Right, right. I, I'm just a guy that's creative, and 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 I and I and I follow through with my trajectory. I create. There's a trajectory. There's a delivery. On to the next project, or keep going and keep 
getting more goddamn juice out of the lemon. It's so funny that you say it like that, like it's uh, about it, it, it being... Uh, uh, you eat a hamburger, right. you digest it, and you shit it out. Absolutely. And then you flush the toilet and off to Detroit River it goes. But it, it's funny that you talk about it being like like a pretentious word because you, you are... I, I am beyond labels now. I'm just... No, no, no. I, I'm 50 years old. I don't give a fuck. No, man. but what I mean is like you, you and your personality have all of the the sort of like because you, you are you're very you're you're a living artist and you have all of the you have all of the pieces where pretension could fucking live so easily and i think one of the things that fascinates uh, me, fascinates me with you uh, so much is that you have all of those qualities but none of the pretension well, my, my my place is pretty ostentatious, but it's very. But it's not pretentious. But, but no, but, but it's but but it's very sincere. Yeah. Every fucking you can point to any fucking thing. By the way, I always purge my apartment uh, every year of anything I don't need. So all that's left is the is the heart of the watermelon. It's the brine of, of everything. There's not almost nothing in my bookshelves that I'm willing to let go of now. I've got rid of everything that meant didn't mean something to me. Right. Everything that's in here means something that's deep meaning to me. And if it doesn't, like that fucking skeleton goddamn cane, <laughs> I'm thinking of getting rid of that next because I don't need you. <laughs> I don't need that in my life. Now it goes. <laughs> but everything else stays, man. Um, okay, so when the last time you and I were hanging out back in 2008, 2009, a billion years ago, you were in, you were in a rough spot. I was stuck in Windsor. I was caught in a, I was caught in a quagmire. I, I couldn't get out. I hit my ceiling off of Windsor. I, 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 I felt like I hit my head off the ceiling of Windsor so many times that I was becoming uh, just dizzy from it. And I was losing my, my hope to even want to make artwork anymore. Uh, just too many years of that shit and then a friend gave me money to get the fuck out and move to Toronto yeah. and I started this is how I'd like to describe it they say if you can make it in New York you can make it anywhere <laughs> and I say fuck you if you can make it happen in Windsor you can make it fucking happen anywhere <laughs> uh, the toughest goddamn place Windsor is like the gravitation the gravity on Jupiter where it's like, 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 like 10,000 pounds. It's like 100 times worse than fucking Earth. <laughs> Moving to Toronto, it's like you're the gravity on Pluto. You can jump 50 feet high. Mm. Finally, when I got out of Windsor, it was like, holy shit, I can jump 50 feet in the air. Why? I opened up galleries. And there's an audience here for everything I did. There's um, What's the difference? Because if, when, I, when I ring the dinner bell, ding, 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 people fucking come. Right. In Windsor... And there's so little to do in Windsor that you turn off and you tune out. So the less there is to do, the less you go out, the less you go out, the less there is to do, the less you go out, the fucking blah, blah. There were so many super cool people I met in Windsor. They go, oh, I don't go out anymore. I'm like, what? You fucking crazy? You're the coolest fucking person. I, I mean, you don't go out. Right. They did. They just, they turned off and they tuned out and they don't go out. Right. And so... The more that happens, the more it eats itself alive from from within. Um, so, based on that, and, and then when you finally do get these people, I used to have to make personal phone calls to invite people to come out. When you finally do get them to come out, um, they'll come out once, go wow, and it's a fucking great night. What a great fucking time! So then, two months later, you call them back to another event, but they don't go out. Yeah, I don't feel like that. They're, they're the one-time willies that they'll come out once a year. Right. So, if you can make it happen in Windsor, fucking Ontario, you can make it happen anywhere. Think of Windsor as as a basic training camp for the big for the big city. And quite often, it's people that are from Windsor come here to Toronto or are kicking the shit out of the place. Yeah, there's there's there are some serious. Uh, Tim McCready kicks the shit out of the place. Uh, a fucking Andrew uh, Andrew Lockheed was kicking the shit out of Tron. There are a ton of Windsorites that come here and punch the fucking pillow right out, man. Yeah. It's because Windsor's a fucking, Windsor's got that fucking thing, man. There's, it, uh, you know, like the hard, you know, hard sharpens hard, or steel, steel sharpens steel, yeah. right? That kind of thing. Krupp steel. You think there's- Strong as Krupp steel. You think the edge of Windsor has- uh, has Windsor's got no it? edge. It just, it's just, it is what it is. It's the gravitational pull that I discussed. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the gravity here's less. So then tell me about, tell me about Toronto. Tell me about your experience since you've been- Toronto, 
I, to me, Toronto was like, like a fucking, to me, Toronto was like being a male model moving to some little hick town of 200 people and they're all girls. And there's a war going on, <laughs> and all the good young, all the young men are gone. It just was easy pickings. Like there were really? just, I don't mean it by, by women, I'm seeing it by mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, everywhere I saw, opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. I move into this incredible apartment. We fix it up like, a, like it's a goddamn penthouse. And then um, I look in across the street. This is the first miracle of Toronto that I was here. I look in, I look out my amazing window, and I go, there's the review cinema. Right next review cinema is the local music music nightclub. Then there's this fucking decrepit old shoe store. What the hell is that? Next to that is a restaurant. Next to that is a restaurant, and below me is a jazz club. What the fuck is that shoe store? What the fuck is that in the middle of all this? And I went down there and investigated it. I looked in the window. There were weeds growing in the window. Yeah. And and I said, whoever has this shoe store, either number one wants to retire, or doesn't want to do this, man. Right. And sure enough, the guy took over his dad's business and he did not want to do it. He gave me the place for peanuts and sold me all the shoes that were in the basement. There were 10,000 pairs of virgin vintage shoes and boxes. I bought those fucking shoes for a couple thousand dollars, then turned the place into a shoe store. I sold every single last pair of shoes and I turned it into an art gallery and Every day that I was there, I was an eight and a half every fucking day of the week. Yeah. Money flowing. I had a toy boat that was this big, a yacht. And every time I made a thousand bucks, I would roll it into a little thing and throw it into the base of the boat. And the boat was filled with money. I felt like a mafia drug dealer with like, I don't know how many thousands of dollars in a toy boat. And I thought, fuck man, if someone said, I want to steal that toy boat. They, they would have had 30,000 bucks cash in the fucking boat. Just from selling shoes. Just selling. Well, my pair, yeah, people would come in, they would just buy shoes. There were no price tags. People just put shoes on the, by the way, there are some, there's footage of documentaries and stuff. I'm talking virgin vintage shoes in the boxes. Do you remember the end of Raiders Lost Ark when yeah. they would go into the giant warehouse filled with, that's what that basement of that place looked like. From the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Holy oh. shit. Mint condition, beetle boots for men of every color. Plus, uh, one is, I'll, I'll grab a pair right now. Wait here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you okay. types of fucking shoes. There are a few surviving uh, fucking copies. Talk to your fans, I'm sure. I'm fucking real. Uh, quite honestly, uh, uh, well, I mean, I don't have anything to say. What do I? What am I gonna say about this? Christian is, is the most incredible. Shoe I'm gonna pair of shoes. Look, look, look. Okay. Rainbow colored. I mean, I, I wore the shit on. Rainbow colored platform, men's platform shoes. Holy shit. Fucking every type of platform. Oh, look at this. These uh, Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse sort of like uh, brogues. Wow. I know, like every goddamn, I sold every fucking last pair. And it was fun, too. And you met a lot of beautiful women. You want me to get up? No, it's not fixing your fur. All right. I killed this animal myself. <laughs> it was a dog, an alley dog. So, all right. So, talk talk to me through that gallery. So, you, when once the shoes were gone. Okay. So we. Uh, so I kicked ass for for two years. I swear to it God. Took two years to sell the. Two shoes? and a half. No, it took a, a a year, and then after that, it was a gallery. It was the Ronsi Street Gallery for a year and a half, and then one day they sold the building, and this rich bald fucker, he checkmated me, and he I, I, and he ousted me. But that's what everyone does here. Everyone, uh, they want to get rid of their tenants so they can go and redo the building. It's, gen it's gentrification and action. Mm -hmm. And I understand it because that's part of the process too. The building was in sorry condition, but I made it look pretty because I'm just good at going into shitholes right, right. and fucking redoing them. But like, um, so then what was fun. the next place? Then, um, then I approached, uh, there was this big event space called 99 Sudbury street. And there was this big Italian guy, six foot six, 300 pounds, solid muscle. His name is Marco. And I convinced, normally it costs like 500 to $1,000 a day to rent this place, but I said to him, look, Marco, I know you don't know who I am, and this is my track record. I want you to let me into super, uh, let me into 99 Sudbury Street for free. But uh, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna bring out 500 to 700 people, and I'm gonna put on these big art exhibitions. You don't have to pay me a fucking penny. 
but I'm going to make you get to keep the, the bar and we'll split half the door and I get to keep the art sales in half the door and artists are going to sell their works and we're going to make a big scene here and draw lots of attention to your place. And I, we did that for two years. Yeah. Yeah. And that really, really, really lit the momentum on fire. And what, how so? Talk to me about what that... What, well, because what, I, I started to develop a formula and I rebranded myself the Super Wonder Gallery. Okay. Because remember, I um, I had a toy line called the Super Wonder Force. Right, right. The Super Wonder Force. Yeah. And um, But you you were using Super Wonder Gallery even back in Windsor, weren't you, no? No, that was Super Wonder Force. Was I? Maybe... No, no. It was the Super Wonder Force... I always said, wasn't it the Super Wonder Gallery that you had across the street? No, that was the Pulitzer Street Gallery. Oh, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, I got a little rule. Sometimes if you make a, a name and it makes you laugh, like we said, the, the maestro. What did we say? The maestro, the maestro sessions? Was <laughs> <laughs> it? No, the maestro... Life, a maestro artist. What, what do we say? Oh, yeah, uh, a maestro artist. Maestro artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maestro artist, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life of my oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm saying>. <laughs> <laughs> the life of, of Maestro. Okay, anyways. Um Super Wonder Gallery, you had a, a rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, what eventually happened was we sort of eclipsed each other. They started getting really, really big and and they and like Google and shit like wanted to rent their space. Okay. So they had to keep bumping us, and I understand because they need to make their fucking big yeah. money. And um, and eventually we had to go our own way. So then we opened up the Super Wonder Gallery on Bloor. Okay. And we did it there epically for two years. And then, of course, gentrification bit us on the ass again. And uh, so then we then we went and got our new place on, on college. And now we're, we have a 10 year lease. Where were you that had the fire? That's where I lived across the street from the first gallery. Oh, uh, okay. Let me tell you something about fighting fires, man, your underwear. Tell me, tell me that story because I remember Jesus seeing the post and it was it, it was scary as fuck just to see okay. the aftermath. First of all, a fire is silent. That's the scary. The only thing you hear is the occasional crackle. But if you were sleeping, you wouldn't goddamn know. Right. You'd wake up with your goddamn hair on fire, and the heat is fucking insane. Um, in this incredible apartment, it was a double decker. First of all, this shit doesn't exist in Toronto. It was the second and third floor. It was a double-decker apartment with the baby grand up there with a winding staircase bringing you up to the third floor. It had skylights, bay windows, two fireplaces, two living rooms, uh, uh, two living rooms on top of one another. Um, it had many bed, had multiple bedrooms. It had an art studio. It had a guest room. It had a jacuzzi sauna room. The guy that originally had this apartment was this cheesy Euro guy who wanted to make it into a Playboy apartment. Okay. And so I took it and made it into a really great Playboy apartment. I, I took whatever was great in 70s and awesome, and I embellished it. I embellished the shit out of the place. Mm -hmm. So like, um, so there was this crazy sauna jacuzzi room, but the sauna room, I didn't like to use it because it smelled moldy after you used okay. it. So I said, ah, fuck it. I'm gonna use it as a storage as a storage room. Okay. And um, I had all kinds of like curtains and, and supplies and stuff for events in there. So my girlfriend at the time, she was having her having a birthday party, and late at night, this chick hooked up with my roommate. Okay. And I guess at like fucking six a.m. She went to go use the bathroom, but she was too fucking drunk to figure out how to turn the lights on. So she turned the dial of the sauna room. My fault. Uh. There was shit leaning against the heater thing with the rocks. Right. And it caught the shit on fire. And so the fire alarm goes off and I'm like, oh fuck, it's that stupid shit. And I go, I open up the sauna room and there's a small fire about this big. Right. And I'm like, I, I, I try fighting. I start beating on it with a shirt. But the more I open the door and beat on it, the more it would grow. So then I'd get outside and oh, I breathe. I hold my breath and I go back and fight again. But, but the more I did it, the more it kept. Yeah. And eventually I ran downstairs and um, and, and I was in my underwear this whole time. And I ran upstairs and and by then the the fire was out of control. And then there became this, this, this tragic moment of realization. Oh my God. 
I just lost the war with the fire. And by the rate that that fire was growing, that fire was growing expo sorry, exponentially. Mm -hmm. There was no way to fight it. And the craziest thing was the bigger it got, the more the, the intense heat would come off your face and you're like, holy shit, there's no way. You threw your bucket of water on it. It, it took like fucking a minute to fill, fill, fill the thing with water. It was a disaster. And I remember walking down the spiral staircase, looking at my piano and all the beautiful, my, my beautiful toy soldier room. And I said, shit, I'm, I'm now in, I, I put on my house coat with my underwear. And I said, I'm gonna literally lose everything I've ever had in my whole life right now. I have, but fuck you fire. I'm gonna take something with me. And so what did I take with me? The pussy sculpture over there. <laughs> so here I am walking out of the fire with a with a vagina restaurant <laughs> sculpture. And and then I went upstairs and said, fuck you, no one's taking my toy soldiers. So I went and took one single box of toy soldiers. So that's all I would have had to show for. Right. But thanks to the Toronto fucking fire people, they came so fast, they put it out. And we only lost the, the bathroom in the hallway and some other shit. But what was really creepy was everything on the second floor, oh, and the back room was all burnt on too. Right. Um, everything, so I had these mannequins and then the mannequins were like tall, six foot mannequins for mm -hmm. sure. Everything from the breast up was baked. But they, it was so far away from the fire. So that tells me this shit was melted. Anything that was six feet and above, the heat was so intense. So if you ran out of a room, right. even if the fire was way down the hall, your hair would, your hair would light up on fire. Right. Because the, the heat would have been so intense. No one ever thinks about that. That's why they say get down low and crawl. Because if you go, maybe there's an invisible thing. If you go above four or five feet, it just the heat will melt your, will, will burn your face. Well, it's also the smoke, it settles. Well, no, the yeah, smoke, yeah, yeah. but I'm telling you, Everything that was about five and a half feet and above was melted. Was, oh, oh, was scorched. But even though the fire never went anywhere near that, right? That must have been an incredible amount of heat. But anyways, eventually I got kicked out of the apartment because of that, anyways, and they used that as an excuse to kick us out and redo the apartment with the insurance. And uh, okay. But that's when my when my life in Toronto really became. I started to grow. Really? Well, yeah, it's because now I always had a bit of a a bit of um, an ability to center myself. When I had always had this, this fucking goofy ability to take my creative creativity and situate myself always in kingdoms created by myself. Like for example, I had this crazy Playboy apartment mm -hmm. and across the street I had my own gallery. Plus I lived on a block where I never had to meet. I had entertainment on the block. I never needed to go anywhere. Right. Everyone would come to me. So here I was, I moved to Toronto and I become like this, this czar of like a street. And I never left the street because that's the, I was in this microcosm. Oh, and then it opened you up and forced it you to get It forced me to become a true Toronto guy. Do, do you think some of that, because that was the, your first place when you moved up here, right? But I've always done that my whole life. No, that's what I was going to say. Do you think some of that was just like the leftover Windsor? Like you, yeah. you were at no, the No, but, but I would use all my creativity on a subconscious level to create a microcosm for myself. But that's not a good thing. Right. It's good to stretch your wings out and go explore Toronto. Do you still keep, do you still explore? Do you get around? Well, yeah, but now everything I do, I got to force myself to go. I, I know how to take all the transit everywhere and not to go anywhere, right. everywhere. What gets you, what gets you out? Cause like you've got, you're one of those guys who's got problems. Again, my, here. again, my, my microcosm, the super wonder gallery is my, uh, anytime, because there's a new thing, there's fashion shows going on there. There's, there's, there's gallery exhibitions. There's, there's crazy themed parties. There's, fa there's, um, there, there's theater there. There's, there's everything you could imagine. So it's like I don't really need to go to nightclubs because my own venue, and I get to drink for free, mm -hmm. I get to buy fun people drinks, um, my own venue changes its its function every day. Right. So, and so I still wish I could go out and spread my wings elsewhere, but I, again, I've created a little microcosm where I don't need to fucking go anywhere but the Super Wonder Gallery. And they just keep coming to you. And I get to be the czar, the king of Super Wonder Gallery. So what's inter what's most interesting to me about the way you talk about the gallery and the way you talk about your life here, like all the things that you're talking about are all pieces of 
things that you did even back in Windsor. Like, I remember you, you had the gallery on Palisha Street. You had, and in that gallery. Oh, I did the same thing in Windsor. I had, I had, yeah. the, I had the crazy YMCA building, yeah. which is my playhouse. I had the, the haunted house downstairs. Right. I had the gallery across the street. Yep. Again, boom, boom, I, I, room I, had the theater in, uh, uh, around the the corner down in the basement. Yeah, yeah. So all the same shit that you're talking about, right? Like yeah. I had a little theater. You, you know here, what I right? like? You know the movie Alien, right? You know those. Whenever the aliens take over a space, it all becomes looks looks like H.R. Giger. Right, right, right. That's me. <laughs> Drop me anywhere, and I'll Christian just... Aldoize the fuck into my neighbor, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll open a corner store of my own across the street, and I'll fucking have a thing over here, and I'll have my fucking. I know it's true. It, it's kind of like fucked up. Except this time, now my gallery is, which is good. I guess my question uh, about that, away. though, is like, do you feel like you were sort of like building pieces of you and now you're at a place where all of those pieces have come into one spot? You know what I mean? I don't know. I like the way the gallery is uh, uh, two miles away. I like that. Yeah. It forces me to get, leave my apartment. Right. Go to the gallery. You said you do, you, like, you walk to the gallery every day from here. I right? walk. I, I take takes me 40 minutes to walk to the gallery, which is the best exercise. And it takes me 40 minutes to walk home. Mm -hmm. That's if someone's not giving me a ride home. But, right. yeah, so that's that's a good exercise. Keeps me in shape, and it's good. Yeah. When you when you go on on your walks back and forth, is it just there, or do you do you stop in? Do you, do you... No, no, I'm on my way to the gallery. I got yeah. to. I'm carrying a heavy goddamn satchel sure. full, of my, full of my computer and my shit, so I just don't want to get Do there. you take any time? to go out and, and see like is there anything else I'm on my way to the gallery why would I go no 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 not then like I just in your life like in yeah life. yeah but but let's face it it's it's I have an empire to run it's yeah so it is it is it is what it is is there anything else in Toronto like what you do like I know there's no. other art galleries but is there no. anything here no no because I, I, I redesign and redecorate the place every day right. using different types. I've got about 10 different types of crazy curtains. Well, curtains, whether it be chintz, classic red velvet, black velvet glitter, or, 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 or blue velvets, white, black. I, I, I redrape the place every day, change where the stages and risers are, change the lighting, um, do the change the layout, truncate the place if I need to, bring the piano out, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And also the the music thing here really really took off here too. What do you mean? The Ronzi boys. Like okay. I started making music at age forty. I taught myself how to play piano, and I I I was a closet case singer, and I didn't know I was a songwriter. I, as a piano player, I'm good at playing my own songs. But I'm not a piano player. Right. But I but I didn't know I had a, a crazy talent for writing songs. Okay. That sort of was um Was that not a thing you did back? No, no. no. I, I, I on a on a deep level, I sort of was of suppressing it. For some who knows what the reasons were. I think it's because I was afraid. Well, there were two things. The other thing I suppressed was wanting to be a fighter. But I knew if I was gonna be an MMA fighter, I knew that it was just gonna break my body down. And also, I got to be careful of getting, because then once I start a project, then I want to go all the way. Right. And I'm, I'm 49 turning 50, so there's no way I'm going anywhere <laughs> with that. And that last thing I want to do is injure myself, because then you'll, I'll carry it with me right. you know, for the rest of my life. Forget it. I don't want to be injured. I'm in good condition. I'm not injured anywhere. Right. Like, knock on wood. Thank God. But, um, yeah, so I thought music was going to be a distraction, but if anything, it enriched my life. Well, we were sort of talking about that before. Like, I, I, I almost think for you, you, you always took on so many projects that, like, to say something yeah. like music was left aside is kind of like saying, yeah, but so was fucking, like, jousting. Like, you take on so many things, like, any movies could be, yeah, like. I, I want to start making movies again, too. I, I Talk think to I'm, me about how $10 Tales got started. Because um, that was a really interesting project. Well, that's the, well, ten dollars tales. Yes, the first thing that we did was Zeno's Inferno. Okay. I wanted to make uh, a sixty style Italian uh, dubbed. We wanted to make a movie that was dubbed in English to make it look like it was like a, a lost gem from Italy back in nineteen late sixties. Right. Which in the end it didn't exactly turn out <laughs> that way. But uh, I was overly ambitious. I took off more than I could chew. But I, I, I cut it down. By the way, it's actually really entertaining now that it's only forty five minutes long. Okay. Cut it way down. Mm hmm. The heart of the watermelon. <laughs> it's much better now. <laughs> right to the dirty parts. <laughs> but, it's, but it's good. It's it's really it's a really good cut. And that's the by the way that's the cut. 
It's 50 minutes exactly. That's the cut I still bring back to theaters once every two years. Right. We always sell out the theater. Yeah? Every time. Yeah. <laughs> no so, more 70 minute fucking yawn fest. No so more. then how did that turn? How did that become $10 tips? Well, we. That was how we cut our teeth. And then Marshall was talking to some of the Kojiko cable. And, um, and Marshall brought it back to me and John Doherty and uh, my brother Marshall. And so then that forced us just to have to make a new movie, a new 22 minute movie every goddamn two months. And so the beautiful thing about that is, is that there's no time to drag your feet. And we would um, come up with a basic story and then we'd battle it out amongst ourselves. And then, and then we would just basically talk about it and then we would start shooting it. But the concept for the show was not only to write, produce and star in the shit, was to create Epic motion pictures with no money. Right. And the joke was it was a $10 tale, so it was done for the budget of 10 bucks. Right. Which is bullshit. Every episode probably end up costing about $80. Right. But um but but that taught us how to to get the most from it. You know? Yeah. To squeeze that all the juice out of that lemon. I like I I really the the stuff that you guys did with $10 tales. I know, like, Gavin and I had a couple of conversations yeah. uh, about it at one point. But I know for me personally, it was one of the one of the things that inspired me, even to this day subconsciously in some ways, because the, it was exactly that. It was like, well, I want to be a filmmaker. What am I going to do? Sit around and wait for fucking Don't, don't, don't go to film school. You get, right. you get Start making movies right away. Forget going to school anymore. I think the only way to ever make anything happen now is... Start calling yourself it. So, like, if let's say I wanted to become um, a brain surgeon, I'll start calling myself a brain surgeon and start offering. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be. That might not be the field. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll move. I'll move, I'll, I'll move to the Andes and start drilling holes in people's heads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm a veterinarian. Right. No, but outside of that, like for for craft stuff, I get what you're saying. You just, you start, what, what I would do is, um, whenever there was a project that I knew I was dragging my feet, I would say, look, I would start saying, hey, everybody, I'm going to make a new movie or I'm shooting a music video. And you say it to enough people where you sort of paint yourself in a corner and people start saying, where's that music video you said you're going to shoot? And I said, oh, yeah, fucking it'll be out by December. And so then you, then now you've trapped now yourself. Fucked. And now yeah. you're I said as a joke, when I'm 50, I'm going to. I'm going to rent out a strip club and I'm going to strip at age 50 and have a big party for all my friends and strip one last time <laughs> and I'll do it and I'll do, I'll look good and I'll work out and everything. It'll keep, it'll keep me doing my push ups and stuff and I'll, it'll be, it'll be like on entertainment tonight or something for his 50th birthday. A 50 year old is stripping alongside 22 year olds just to say he can do it. Right. Talk to me about that's actually, I would love to hear that story. Can you tell me about your stripping days? The stripping days, wow. Because I didn't know well, you back then, but it I... It goes, it's much... Actually, the the stripping, the secret stripping life is far more interesting than people think. I was born in 1969. I'm 49. In August, I'll be 50. I first stripped in 1987. Holy shit. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Talk about that. That is a fucking bombshell. All right. I, in 1987, I had aspirations to go to CCS, Center for Creative Studies in Detroit. And, um, and my parents were kind of going through a divorce. So this whole dream about me going to this expensive art school went down the fucking tubes. Okay. And, um, and I remember one time my dad, when you're a dad... You got to be careful of what you say off the fucking cuff. <laughs> Remember one time you're featuring male strippers, and my dad goes, "That's a great way to make some good money and blah blah blah, pay yourself through school." I was like a kid when I heard him say that. Right. That fucking thing, that idea, stuck in my head. No shit. Stuck in my fucking. Do you head. know how old you were when? Ah, uh, probably eleven. Okay. And um, and I remember there was this troubled kid that I grew up with, and beat up every now and then, by the way, who got murdered in New Mexico. Oh, they found him in a dumpster. Um, Wasn't you, was it? Anyway. What the hell was they doing in New Mexico? <laughs> anyway, um, he was stripping at the time. He goes, yeah, man, I'm stripping at this fucking club. Duh, 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 duh. And so he goes, you should strip. That's an easy way to make some money. 
and, and I went down there and um, the place was getting ready to go out of business. Okay. And not only that, it was for stripping for women and, and no woman's going to want some fucking 17 or 18 year old kid stripping for them. It looks unless she's a fucking perv. Right. Why would she? A woman wants a man. I was a fucking, I was a fucking new waiver kid. <laughs> and then someone goes, why don't you go strip at the gay club? And there was, it was, um, it was JP's was the name of this fucking place. Okay. It was JP, yeah, JP's. And, um, I remember, um, we were like, it's a gay club. They're going to rape us. <laughs> and, um, and so we went into the gay club and the, and the, and the manager, his name was Joe. He was this big old, he was this big guy. And, um, he was a priest at one time. And he goes, um, come on in. And he goes, let me look at you. Take your clothes off, let me look at you. I'm gonna take my clothes off. And, and back then it was all about the G-string. I remember buying a fucking stupid <laughs> G-string. And um, he goes, turn around. I thought, oh no. <laughs> and he goes, okay. Go on, what song you want? I remember I put on Depeche Mode. <laughs> and let's play Master and Servant. And I, and I go out and I'm dancing and he goes, okay, it's fine. I'll see you on Friday night, uh, blah, blah, blah. Get your songs on. And there I was stripping at JP's. And it was, back then it was uh, five. And then Where was this? I lied about my age. It was not 18. Yeah, yeah. I was not even 18 yet. I lied about my age. It was, um, it was on the waterfront. Um, Right Vince? near where there's that there was that radio tower, on oh uh, down there. Oh, but it's okay. torn down now. It okay. no longer exists. All right. Five dollars a table dance, no touching. Um, and it was just um, Americans. Could, here's here's why it was so popular. Americans could not. The the law over in the states is you can't drink alcohol right. and, and look at a cock. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you go, you'll go cross cross eyed. If you look at it once, I don't know what the. <laughs> I had to bite his cock because I was drinking alcohol. To be fair, you were also fucking... you also couldn't drink alcohol and look at vaginas either. That's right. Yeah. You cannot. Yeah. yeah. And so I did that all through high school, the end of high school, and I was I was saving up my money. I was all excited, and then I started to realize, oh my fucking god! This is there's but there's something a little more interesting here though because this is at a time when. Like the late gay, 80s, man. The late gay 80s. thing was still like it wasn't like it wasn't necessarily safe to be gay or associated with. Not really. You know, you disappear in the club. It just ah, you really? know what? No, it was didn't fine. have any of that, eh? Yeah. Oh well, that's good news. Well, maybe if there was, I don't really remember any of that. I just you went to the club and it's all just just men with their mustaches, little fuck anywhere in their 80s. I don't clothes. mean inside the you bar. Know? I mean coming out of the bar. Like it, no. The strippers, the only strippers you'd get into a taxi and go home. No yeah. one gave a shit. It's oh. just, it was kind of isolated. No one gave a shit. Okay. Yeah, I did that for a few years, and then um, that was it. But that wasn't. Uh, that was my first time into it. Okay. Then, so I always so I had that skill. Right. So as a full time artist for all those years, and when I moved to New York. And by the way, I got some crazy New York stories. Right. But there were a few tough. There were a few tough months in New York, and so um, I said, "Shit, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go strip." And there was this famous place. So where are the male strip clubs? Now Stella's. Stella's was the was on Forty Second Street, I think. Nowadays, I imagine it's all gentrified now. Right. This ain't no fucking shitty strip club, but it was the grossest, sleaziest. Most grotesque gay strip club ever, you could imagine. Right. Holy shit! And they were all like Puerto Rican, hey white boy, all the Puerto Rican. They're all laughing and, and telling jokes. You fucking doing tricks? Yo, you doing tricks? And, and I would go there, and and you'd go on stage, and, and, and you do your thing, and and this is how you made your money. You'd walk around in your underwear. And and these men would would stuff one dollar bills into your fucking and your into your goddamn little pair of tight underwear. Right. That, that, like after the other night, I got fifty dollars, sixty dollars. <laughs> but all these other Puerto Rican guys going, oh yeah, fucking count my money. You fucking you selling your little ass. All they're doing is ever is, is they're putting each other down. Eh, for what everybody's doing. What, but but how come everyone else is making like six, seven, eight hundred bucks? I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. But I always noticed, like, when I was in the dressing room, always, like, one of those strippers would come through the dressing room and they were being followed by managers, and they'd go in this doorway. That wouldn't even occur to me. And then eventually, after a couple weeks, I realized 
these aren't managers following them up the thing. Right. I thought, what? Where the fuck are they going? And I'd, I'd open the door, and I'd, there was a stairwell leading up. And there's condoms all up the stairwell. Get and I look at the top out. of the stairs, and the guy's fucking him right in the ass. I'm like, <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> Excuse me. And I laugh. Yeah, so it was like everybody there was a hooker. Right. I was the only guy just doing my job. Right. Like everybody there was fucking, they were gay for pay. And I, I think they were straight guys, but they just didn't care. They were gay for pay. Right. Well, I don't even know what their wiring was, but it was so funny. All, they were all ribbing one another for, for doing tricks and shit, putting each other down, laughing, making fun of one another, but they were all doing it. Everyone. And me, I was just oblivious to what was really going on. I was wondering why I was only making $50 a night on tips on the floor. So tell me about New York. New York was, when I was, um, when I was in my, I've always been very brave. And even when I was scared, the, the bravery thing goes back my dad is a super dad. He's a loving dad, like a super dad. But he was a hitter. Okay. Yeah, he was a hitter. So um, as a kid, we had to fight. We had to meet all my friends, my circle of friends. We were nerds, man. We, we, we were into Star Wars toys. We were into toy soldiers. We were into like running around with toy guns, playing fucking army. Like we were fucking nerds. We were into sports, man. We were into fucking Indiana Jones. And... Every time these, these tough kids hanging around near Mary's Corner store, smoking players' light cigarettes and playing pinball, they would always want to beat us up. Yeah. And I was always the kid. Out of all my group, I was the only one that would fight. But the crazy thing was, um, but I was, I was scared shitless. Uh, but I don't know why I stepped up to bat to fight them. And the craziest thing was, knock on wood, I'd always win. Right. I don't know how. And I'd always win by sheer luck. But there was a funny thing that sort of um, was a byproduct from always defeating these big, scary bullies. Was that every time I ever wanted to do something in life, I would get that same feeling like, oh no, it's stand-up comedy, I'm afraid. Right. And so I'd overcome that fear, the same fear as I'd fight the big kids. Um, and I would go do it. And when I had to pull it off, it would, it, I would get this incredible feeling like, oh my God, mm -hmm. I did it. And so that always, every time there was ever anything that I had a fantasy about, I just would just do it. Mm -hmm. And I would just face the bully. The bully was the fear of it. Right. And I would just pull it off. So my big fear was moving to New York. And so stupidly, I moved to New York with a girlfriend that I had at the time. And she goes, I want to live in New York too. <laughs> and so we moved to Manhattan with no money, no green card, no bank account, no connections, and no way around the place. But out of my, I had this complex that it was destiny. I was gonna stay in New York and be a New York artist. I was crazy brave. Even though I was scared shitless. So you get part of that right, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was part of that complex. <laughs> I thought, if I could over... But, but I never... I, I, it, was, it was part of that complex. Yeah. And um, we lived for an entire month in the YMCA. We depleted all of our money. Right. And we were down to a, uh, enough money to buy a Snickers bar. And we had just gone to go see an apartment. And the realtor gave me shit and said, don't waste my fucking time. Um, you can't afford this place. Why, wait, have me come down here and waste my time. And I, and I felt really embarrassed and really humiliated. And it just so happens, I was wearing a sculpture jacket that I made that day, and I had my portfolio under my arms. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of those New York miracles that happened to me. All right. And I, and I turned to my girlfriend and I said to her, I said, well, it looks like we're not going to siege the castle. And at that moment, a crazy man was walking down the street singing out loud. And I said to her, I said, do you notice the way there's always crazy people singing out loud in New York? Suddenly this guy grabs me and goes, wow, that's an amazing jacket. I told him oh, I'm an artist and I made it. And he pulled us into a cafe and was looking through my portfolio. My leather, beautiful leather, brown leather portfolio, which I still have to this day. And um, 
And he goes, and I told him my dilemma, and he goes, no, man, it's destiny. You're going to stay in New York City. And I said, that's impossible because we're out of money. And he goes, do you know who David Rockefeller is? And I said, Rockefeller Center? He goes, yes, David Rockefeller. I work directly for David Rockefeller, and I want you to trust me. I want you to lend me this portfolio. If Mr. Rockefeller likes your work, we're going to get an apartment for you and, and, and pay first and last month's rent and put it in our name. The very next morning, I got, we got a call from and the people at YMCA. There's someone down on the phone who wants to talk to you. I got on there. It was James. Uh, Christian, Diane, get your stuff on and meet me at this corner. We're going apartment hunting. They got an apartment for me. Get the fuck out of here. 22nd and 3rd Avenue. Paid for by David Rockefeller himself. That's fucking crazy. Boomba! That was, did my, you ever meet him? I, this is how I met him, watch. Right. I went to one time. Watch now, it, you're off now, the camera. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> so, so, what happened was I stayed in there for about seven months and then I scored a, a loft in lower Manhattan, which I wanted to turn into a gallery. So I was told to go to Mr. Rockefeller's house to get some money. And it was on, it was on um, 72nd and 3rd Avenue or something. No, 70, it was on 72nd Street East, I think. Or near, I think near the, near the Cafe Carlisle. Something, something like that. And it's all brownstones. You know the way like in Sesame Street? But what you don't know is there's like five or six of them and they're all secretly connected as one right, big right, house. Yeah, but yeah. you wouldn't know that. Yeah. And I remember going up to the door and the door opens and it's all security guards and shit like CIA type people. Right. And um, there he was at the end of the hallway and he went like this. And then James Hines comes down the hallway and hands me an envelope. So his, just his nod was all I ever got from the guy. No fucking but way. From here to like, to where the kitchen is. No, a little further away from that. That's it. So he knew I was. Maybe guys like this, when they see artists or people they believe in, it's their little way of giving back. Like well, every now and then, you're gonna help this guy. And that's it. So paid first and last month's rent for the fucking apartment, and then paid the first month's rent for the loft, which I turned into the 4E gallery. Holy so shit. So there are miracles. There are gods out there that will touch you on the nose, but, but you gotta want it. You gotta, you gotta say, I believe a snowflake's gonna land on my tongue. And you go, nah. <laughs> but only because I was so brave and I knew, <laughs> I said I knew it was my destiny. But nowadays, as yeah, as, but dude, I, I would I, never do that now. Yeah, I was like, like, I'm like, you fucking nuts. I don't have any money in my bank account. For, for every one of you guys that can have that story, and by the way, the grand total of that count is one. Well, first off, I gotta say, <laughs> Even your friend wouldn't get an apartment for you. No. Would David Rockefeller, really? one of the fifth most powerful people on the planet? Right, right. This is not a real diamond. <laughs> um, what are the chances of that? It, it, it almost was ser It was almost like a fucking destiny. Now I don't believe in predestined. De right, right. But I believe, I believe in the machine gun theory. Okay. In life, is shoot enough of them and a few will hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people do this in life, and that's why well, I'm not getting anywhere. Mm. It's because you're doing this. <laughs> Bang. <Pop. laughs> Me, I believe in fucking getting off my Thomas and machine gun. <laughs> oh, I got it four or five times. Fucking get out your MG42. 1,200 rounds a minute. That's the way I go. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Christian Aldo. Thank you for hanging out with us on this episode of the AVB Podcast. Make sure you uh, swing on down there uh, below. You'll find links to his gallery and, and be able to contact Christian and all that stuff as well. As I might. No, I don't want to make artwork anymore. I hate it. It's, it's by his artwork. Um, it's incredible. But yeah, uh, so down below, uh, we've got, you can make sure you click on the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the bell uh, for notifications so that you get uh, all this if stuff. You're, if you're attractive, uh, feel free to call me at 416-516-5457. <laughs> and um, come on over. We can make a fire and I uh, will take some wine and we'll play with toy soldiers. We will see you next time, folks. Christian, thanks for hanging out, brother. My and thanks for having us here, man. Thank you.
That'll do it for this episode of the ABB Podcast. Don't forget, you can subscribe to our full audio episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you find your audio podcasts. The full episodes, highlights, and our live off-the-floor performance videos can be found at our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The AVB Podcast. Of course, you'll find links to our incredible sponsors and this week's guest in the description below. The AVB Podcast is part of the Border City Network. Find more great content at BorderCityNetwork.com. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.